Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Okay, so this is going to be fun. I get to interview Faye. <laughs> so, Faye, it's your turn on the hot seat. Why don't we start with what is 21 to Watch? Yeah, so 21 to Watch is basically a showcase of the most innovative, exciting startups coming out of the east of England. And how did you come up with this idea? It was another one of Faye's crazy ideas, basically. So when I first started Cofinitiv, I, for the first couple of years, I was going to these award events and they were great. And the companies that were winning the awards were all the big organizations. Again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I kind of sat there and I thought, these big organizations, everyone already knows them and they're already doing great things. And the market we work in is those startups, is, you know, the really exciting, innovative companies. And I'm like, what, what's out there for them? So I just thought, let's give it a go and see if um, we can come up with a program that really celebrates the up and coming and give them, a, you know, use our media might to give them a little bit of a leg up. So we came up with this idea at 21, maybe don't ask me where that number came from, because honestly, it kills us every single year now. Um, well, it's better than five or 10. Well, yeah, because knowing me, I just wanted it to be something a little bit different. And 21 is definitely a number that no one else would possibly consider for an awards event um so yeah we just came up with this idea of 21 to watch and we tried it and and we just got some really great support literally from from year one and your your comms and media chops are showing by having the brand name as a hashtag right from the off as well so it just drives the whole social media side of things as yeah, well yeah and that that i mean to be honest that was part of the point of it being 21 to watch because one to watch everyone uses you know 10 to watch you can't i mean we actually had a slight issue in 2021 because a few other people used 21 to watch and you can imagine how annoyed i was about that That's um, every hundred years problem though right <laughs> yeah yeah oh, crack it. oh god we're going to be doing it for a hundred years i'm sure um yeah no i mean it's it's great we 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 use the hashtag really widely and it's people recognize it which is great so how many people have been through the program so far so we've been doing it this was our fifth year um this year and we've had just 1400 submissions to be listed but not all of those make it and that's just for cambridge and the surrounding area yeah so it's the east of england so the very first year we did it one of the companies who actually went on to win was colorifics and their base they actually moved out of cambridge for a variety of reasons and when we looked around there was so much innovation actually in norwich and essex and so so we just said let's do it for the east of england okay. the reality is actually 80, 90% of the nominations and the winners each year come from Cambridge, but that's just by virtue. But we want to be inclusive and we want to try and showcase some of the other areas as well. So yeah, 1,435 to be exact submissions we've had over the five years, but about half of them have actually made it onto the list. You know, we have some quite strict criteria uh, for getting them on like we have one company who they submit almost every year and they've got 300 million of investment we cap it at like 12 13 million um, but they love it so much they just can we be on the program no you can't be on the program so, so that that kind of answers a question i was going to ask you you can you can apply for multiple years yeah so Obviously, everyone can apply. That's fine. Um, they don't necessarily get on the list every year. They have to have done something different. So Calium Health's a great example. They were a company win in 2021. Um, they appeared back on the long list this year because they've had such a successful year. Um, so they really wanted to engage and just be back on the list. Um, so, so yes, they can. And also you get quite a lot of companies that it's a timing thing. So they might be on the long list for a couple of years and then they might just jump to top 21. Um, so it depends what stage they're up to and obviously how the judges judge them. So this literally this week um, was the, uh, the top 21 for 2023 announcement event. How did that go? It was really good. 
it's a curated event. So it's all the people that win, plus some of the alumni and the long listed companies. And then we invite people that can really support them in the in the ecosystem. So, you know, there's funds in there, there's professional services, there's people that that can offer them office space like the Bradfield Center, who are one of our, our supporters. And it went really well. I did so I was I did a typical Faye and I actually started the whole of the conference with the word tea bags, um, just to kind of get people's attention and they kind of looked at me John Gord from Cambridge Network clapped because I think he was going what on earth is she doing now Um, but there was logic there because I was talking about discoveries and innovations from Cambridge so I did then qualify it with specifically round tea bags thank you Cambridge (laughs) and who were the judges Um, So we had Maximilian G, who you know very well from Epoch. We had Hannah Digibodo from Santa Capital, Tom Britton from Syndicate Room and John Stenhouse, who runs the innovation ecosystem at the University of Essex. So let's cut to the chase then. Who were the top seven people? Okay, so a really passionate group of people. So the first person who presented was Amma Frimpong, and we're going to be talking to Amma shortly as well. Um, She was named the Institute of Engineering and Technology's Young Woman Entrepreneur of the Year in January this year. We then had Broderick House, who is doing two different things. He's looking at a venture revolutionising personalised nutrition and also a piece of work on global food insecurity. Coco Newton, who is a founder of Fathom Cognition, and she's looking at cognitive markers that help detect Alzheimer's. Elena Sismiju, who's a neuroscientist, and she's really interested in looking at the human mind and virtual reality. She was listed in The Telegraph as the top 100 female entrepreneurs to watch. We then had Dr. Hannah Saw, who's the founder of Farm Enable, looking at next generation of complex 3G small molecule drugs. Lucy Jung, who we also had on the podcast previously, um, was was on the list. And then we finished with Dr. Zoe Tolkien, who is actually working for a long established company, um, but she's doing a lot of work on the ramp up of silicon carbide for semiconductors and electric transport. So really diverse group of people. And then there's also a category for companies. What what did that look like for this year? So we had Felix at Broken String Biosciences, which is a genomics tool company. We then had Cambridge Smart Plastics. Again, they've been on the podcast um, in the past, so they're relaunching plastics for a smart and sustainable future. Helio Display Materials is going to come on in a moment and, and talk to us as well. Um, it's a, That's actually a joint spin-out venture from both Cambridge and Oxford, and they're looking at um, digital technologies. Hutton Bio, they're aiming to decarbonise long-distance transport, Qkine and Catherine Elton was a previous person winner and this time it was great to have them back in as a company winner and they're a UK manufacturer driving innovation in growth factor proteins. Roadfill, which use recycled waste plastics destined for landfill or incineration to repair and relay roads. And Spirea, they've basically been created to advance a new generation of antibody targeted cancer treatments. Last but not least, I think my favourite category of any awards show is seven best things. Things, I know, it's it's baby, typically Faye, isn't it? Things, so so Carol always rewrites this to innovations, but I'm like, no, I like things. And actually one of the contestants, one one of the winners yesterday jumped up on stage and went, well, it seems that we have a thing and I quite like that. So they were Cambridge Sensoris and that's easy to install all weather technology for the drone revolution. Infosense, we've also had them on the podcast, which is a game changing deep tech technology at the edge. Kirby, so a couple of EV activities here. So Kirby's the first one, which is revolutionizing on street EV charging for the majority of people that don't have the facility for charging at the roadside. Um, Power, we know from Tech Nation, which is an EV charge card and app. Then we have SomaServe, who have the Polynaut technology. Permetrics, another company from Technation Rising Stars, um, who have their Warm Score 
um, solution about decarbonizing housing with the software and sensors. And last but not least, winner of one of the Trinity Bradfield prizes was a voila, um, which is the food waste separation technology. Yeah, yeah. Abil, great guy. You know, I have to say, that was actually really hard, quickly saying 21 companies. And, you know, I only but you give... came up with 21. I know, I know, I know, once again. Um, and I only gave them 60 seconds to actually do their own pitch Oh, yesterday. well, at the actual, yes. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's really, really fast and furious. So I think it's probably only fair that I had to do that very quickly too. But they're all on the website. You can always just go and look them up. Yeah, they'll be linked on the show yeah. notes as well. So just before we speak to the winners... What's the, why get involved? What's the actual benefit for the teams and the companies and the things? So, you know, Tom Collins spoke yesterday evening and he said it so brilliantly, so I probably should have invited him on. And he, he basically explained to everyone it was the the impact that it gave him at Callium Health. So, you know, he, he said we're a really early stage company and we don't have the ability to get ourselves out there. You know, so what 21 to Watch does is it offers them a platform where they leverage our might of, of you know, getting to the media and getting the stories out there and knowing the ecosystem. So it's a, it's a huge PR opportunity for them, in essence. The, you know, that's from, from our perspective. But more than that, you know, we have a huge amount of sponsors and partners that really support that program. And they give tens of thousands of pounds worth of prizes to each of the top 21. So it might be, you know, workshops, consultancy, um, office space, meeting room um, activities. You know, there's a whole package of benefits that these companies get and, and they love it. You know, it really does help them. And it also, it forms a great community. So yesterday we had Colorifics and Paragraph and Better Origin, some of our alumni that that were there and they were talking to some of the companies on the long list who were going through the pain points that they had three four five years ago you know and you, you just you literally can't buy that so last question is there anyone that didn't make the cut that you think should have you know i i feel that they're all they're all my babies um to a certain extent when we start, so every September it starts in earnest. It runs year round, but every September it launches. And we always announce with a certain number of companies, peoples and things. And at that point in time, I, I look at them and I'm like, they're definitely going to be top 21. But the year progresses and the judges do their work. And, and sometimes quite a few of them don't make it. They're still on the long list and they still get all of the benefits of, of being on the long list. But companies like Seta Genomics and Wave Photonics, um, Viridian Seeds, you know, there's some really exciting companies coming up. Um, so, but hopefully maybe they'll appear next year or the year after. So let's talk to two of the winners from this year. The only fair way to pick was to be completely random, but I'm sure we'll be getting the others on in due course. So welcome to Emma and Simon. Thanks for taking the time to come in today. Why don't we open up by just getting to know you a little bit better? So can you introduce yourselves? Hi, so my name's Emma Frimpong. I am the 2022 Young Women Engineer of the Year, uh, awarded by the Institution of Engineering and Technology. And I also work as Head of Product Development at a local Cambridge startup called 52 North Health Limited. Hi, yes, I'm, I'm Simon Jones from Helio Display Materials. Um, I'm CEO there and uh, we're busily working on revolutionary materials for displays. So we had fun, I think, on Thursday evening. How was the event for you? I always love those events because Cambridge is such a vibrant community and those events are where we find each other and find the opportunities to work with each other and make the the whole you know, greater than the sum of the parts. And you know, that's the whole being greater than the sum of the parts happening. Uh, events like that so thank you for organizing enjoyed it enormously it was really lovely to meet everybody and actually it showcases so much of the diversity that we have in Cambridge you know there was 
there was no shortage of talent and um, exposure and, you know, people from different areas working on fascinating, fabulous innovations. Um, it was really great to meet them, talk to them, learn from them, share ideas, see where they're all at in the journey and see where people are going and the sort of future prospects that a lot of the innovations and companies and people in the in the ecosystem have. It's, it's quite inspiring, actually. It was a very inspiring evening on Thursday. Thanks for having us. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And and you were the first person to present, Emma. What was it like being the first one up on the stage? Uh, yeah, it was the first person up. It's um, it's a two-edged sword, I think. Um, you don't really have anything to compare it to because nobody has gone before you. But also in some respects, you, you just go, you get it done and then you move on. But it was really nice to just be able to talk about things that I love to do both outside of work and uh, in my sort of career as well. So it was great to just be able to, able to talk about that. It was good. Great. So you mentioned in your intro then, and it was one of the reasons that you were on the list, was this accolade that you received for Young Woman Engineer of the Year. What what does that mean to you? That award was pretty much a culmination of everything that I've done to this date. So it meant so much. Um, as a, a woman engineer, it's a, it's a real challenge to break into the the, the profession, to, to do the work that we're doing, but to be able to succeed at it and also be recognised for that success, it's so big. And one of the ideas behind the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award by the IET is to be able to showcase women. So the profession still has, the percentages are 16.5 or, or so, you know, percentage of women in engineering in the UK at the moment. That's incredibly low considering how many women are alive, you know, use the technologies that we're creating. Um, all of those people should be able to be part of the innovation, the technology, the doing stuff. And we don't have that many. And there is a, a saying that says, you know, being able to showcase people when people see it, they can be it. And so that's one of the big premises of the award to just make us accessible to the younger generation, to show them that there are people that are working in the profession and are able to succeed at it. So, you know, come have a go at it as well. It's great. It's doing well. And so it means so much to be that person and to sort of show that my journey is worth something to somebody else as well, which is really good. Very important, isn't it? So, um, and that translates then into your day job where you manage the engineering team at NutriCheck. So t tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the company is called 52 North Health and we're making NutriCheck. So our vision at 52 North Health is to be globally competitive in clinical decision support. And what that means is we want to be able to create tools that a clinic can use to help their sort of day-to-day -day job and um, to make their lives easier and to make patients' lives better as well. And our first product is NutriCheck. So what NutriCheck does, it, it helps identify patients who are at risk of a life-threatening condition, which is a byproduct of chemotherapy called neutropenic sepsis. And that is fatal. And so we've created this very low cost device that they can use at home that helps give an indication of to, as to whether or not you should be running into hospital or if you can be managed outside of the home. And we've created this really cool platform technology that allows you to measure both a solute and a cell in you know, a low cost way. And that had not happened before we managed to get this working. So we're really excited about that. And so what I do is um, I manage the engineering teams in and out of the company. We use a lot of external people people were a small team but to get that product onto the market there's a lot of work that's gone into that getting the innovative technology working because you come up with a great idea and then you have to implement yeah. it and so that's what we've been up to and we're hoping to do our clinical trials and then submit for regulatory approval um, towards the end of the year and we're also going through our we're about to go through our series a funding so that it's all happening it's all happening. And is it like a wearable device or a standalone unit that you use to test? Or So it's a, um, uh, a handheld device. So it's akin to what people would recognise these days, a lateral flow device. Yeah. So it's based on lateral flow technology, but rather than a one strip and putting saliva on, we've got two strips and you take a finger prick of blood because we're looking for biomarkers in your blood that says, are you immunosuppressed? So do you have neutropenia, which is when your white blood cells are a little bit low? And are you at risk of sepsis, which then becomes the infection and can be quite fatal because you're immunocompromised. And so we take a little finger prick of blood, we put it on the device and then it runs. And what we We've done with the engineering is we've said you know for us it's really important that our patients are 
getting the care that they need, you know, through our device. And we're making the experience as painless, you know, the, the whole experience can be quite difficult. So we're trying to do our little bit for them. So from the device side of things, what we've done is we've incorporated everything into the one device. So from your lateral flow COVID days, you'll remember that you had to find a buffer solution and you'd have to like drop on a couple of jobs, you know, is it four? Is it five? Shall I drop one extra? Yeah. Um, and we've taken all that away. And what we've done is we've incorporated that all into the device. So all the user has to do is take a finger prick of blood, put it on the device and turn a dial. And when you turn the dial, it does all the magic on the inside for you. And then it gives you a couple of lines on the test. So you've got two strips and you have to read those. And then it'll tell you. So the, the results of those will tell you where you're sat um, on that spectrum. Um, what we've also done, so we recognise that it can be quite difficult to recognise, you know, where the line can be, what is it looking like. So we've got an optional app. And actually, we've done a lot of work on our app to give information. So there's a couple of things that it could be doing. It'll be giving general information to the patients. You know, they don't know enough about neutropenic sepsis. So what is it about? What does it mean for you on your, and your journey? you know what sort of symptoms can you be looking out for and then we've incorporated so back to the sort of reading that line we're planning to put in a visual reader so that they can have a look so we've got a physical card that they can use to interpret the lines but if you wanted a little bit more and you were struggling and you had an app because it's optional you could use that to sort of automatically read the results for you right. and it's all sort of our way of saying we're really interested in your journey we really want to change and revolutionize revolutionize that care pathway what can we do to make it better for you and we've got all these tools that you can use so we're working quite hard on that and um, and the app will continue to evolve because we'll continue to be able to put new functionality that we find out from the patients are useful for their journey and we can put those in there so quite a diverse set of responsibilities as head of engineering then you're doing hardware design you're doing software development you're doing a bit of everything so actually so our team's growing so we do have a software dedicated team so we have a chief digital officer and we've got one of our new joiners our head of digital development so actually we we're now at that place where we're growing and we're able to dedicate resource and time and expertise to the different areas so my work is now streamlined quite a lot into that area of doing the um, hardware platform form development and less of the software. So Simon, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Helio display materials? I'd love to. So we're all familiar with displays. I mean, they're totally pervasive and ubiquitous, um, uh, but actually they're not very good. I mean, there's a lot of improvement potential in displays. They can use less power, they can display more colours, they can be brighter. And there's a huge amount of innovation continuously going on in displays because it's a very competitive industry and it's a massive industry. It's $150 billion in display panels. So what we're doing with a particular chemistry called perovskites is improving the colours and the brightness and the power consumption of displays. And we're doing it by providing an enabling material so that goes in at the beginning of the value chain that's built on by the panel makers and the device makers. And what we're setting out to do is provide materials which can be used by existing factories. So this is a bit counterintuitive as sometimes people say to me, why aren't you trying to completely disrupt this industry? And I say, well, actually, don't want to disrupt it because there's a huge manufacturing infrastructure. If we can provide a material and all of those factories produce something more valuable and higher performance, then that's where the value is really going to come and it minimises the barriers to adoption of the technology. So that's what we're aiming to do. So you mentioned that use of advanced materials. Is that something that you invented? Is that a proprietary thing? Well, it's something that one of our founders, Henry Snaith, discovered working with these materials in his lab in Oxford University wow. some time ago. And he, he realised that they had some very outstanding optoelectronic properties which would have a fundamental impact on displays. So he contacted his um, ex-professor, Professor Sir Richard Friend in Cambridge University, and uh, Richard is a founding father of the OLED business, and, and so the two of them are an incredibly formidable pair. So they, they filed some very fundamental and broad patents in this area and founded a company, which was Helio, and it's actually the first joint spin out between Oxford and Cambridge. I'm absolutely delighted to have a foot in both camps in terms of Oxford and Cambridge with Helio. 
So you talk about disrupting industry. So I guess your challenge then is convincing existing man manufacturers to adopt this new material without disrupting their production lines and all those kinds of things and like having a big swing from where they are right now. I guess that's similar to any generational shift in new technology for displays. They have to go through that adoption of new technologies, new, new products, etc. So it makes a very big difference whether you're having to push or whether you're being pulled. And I'm delighted to say that actually the industry is pulling us, our kind of technology, because it's solving a very real design problem that they're all trying to address at the moment. And this, this is the design problem around improving colour performance and reducing power consumption. So, Simon, you're still on the start of the journey for helio display materials. So where are you up to in terms of funding? Well, we're very fortunate to have some incredibly supportive and deep-pocketed investors, and um, we've just raised uh, uh, another tranche of Series A funding, which has um, enabled us to further expand our labs and our team, which is very exciting. We've got our first employee in Asia, and we'll be building a team in probably in Taiwan um, around that, that person and our lead customer. So um, it's exciting and actually getting into Asia is so important for us in the displays industry and so exciting as well. Things are opening up there now so we can actually travel. I was there last week in Taiwan and that was a huge excitement for me after so many years waiting for to be able to do that. You're both, yeah, you're both on slightly different stages of fundraising, but you're just about to start your Series 8, Emma, is that right? So are you, have you taken advantage of the Cambridge ecosystem in that sense, the kind of support that you're getting from local investment groups? Has that been a big part of an advantage being based in Cambridge? Absolutely. I mean, Cambridge Enterprise are one of our investors and have been mentoring the company from sort of its inception, um, as well as the, the entire ecosystem. You know, there's a lot of programs, inter entrepreneurship, accelerators, things that you can benefit from just being in the ecosystem. So, I mean, for us as a team and as a company, we really benefited from that connection, knowing those people, being able to be mentored by them. And um, there were lots of people in the room on Thursday that had been part of our journey at different times, you know, from investors to mentors to lawyers, you know, and they're all part of the ecosystem. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been really helpful for us. You've had a similar experience, Simon? Absolutely. And I say the same thing about people in the room. The skills and experience that are accessible in, in, in this ecosystem and also in Oxford um, have been fantastic. We also have Cambridge Enterprise as one of our supporters and, and angel investors, including, for example, Herman Hauser, who's oh. very much a Cambridge ecosystem person. Oh. Yes, it's a fantastic place to be from that degree of support. And I've been here since the mid-90s, and um, I'm, I'm glad to have spent so much time here and see it evolve. It's great to see two deep tech companies getting involved in something like 21 to Watch, because I think a lot of deep tech companies don't connect the dots and see the opportunity that something like 21 to Watch provides with the, the exposure and the publicity that it generates. Why did you get involved and what's your experience has been like? We can, we can be honest in front of Faye, I think. Oh, crikey. <laughs> I can I can say a little about this. So for me, it's too faceted to be honest. Um, I find myself having two bits to myself. You know that the that person that's wanting to promote engineering to young people and to um, young girls, and then there's the me that's an engineer wanting to you know work in this company and bring this fascinating innovation to the world. And on the on the one side to promote engineering and to get young people and young girls to do it, you need to be accessible. You need that exposure. You need to be out there so they can see. And that's what 21 to Watch does. You know, it takes you as a person with all your experiences and all your, you know, what you're doing, what you're wanting to say, and it puts you at the front. And then on the other side, from a company perspective, we then have access to investors, to, you know, fellow companies who are in similar stages. You know, Helio have just done their Series A. I'm going to be picking some questions and asking Simon things about that. And it's that sort yeah. of thing that 21 to Watch does because it brings all these different people and you never really know who and what can influence you and your journey. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a really great thing to be part of. Well, of course, really excited to help. And, um, and I was really impressed by the people in the room, and there's some wonderful people in the room last night, you know, the seven individuals you picked, willing to help those people, and, and hopefully that's a kind of give and take that, that makes things work. I 
think that so you have to do a certain amount of things like this anyway so people can find you right i mean you yeah, can search for people but if you if you arrive at these sorts of events then that's the opportunity for people to connect with you and ask for things mm-hmm. and that's important so as you say it gives you a platform for like you know when you're recruiting candidates are going to find you there's going to be interest there's going to be buzz it feels like there's it's a hot business to join all of those things are so important Thank you for that and congratulations again. So what's next for you both, Simon? Well, as I mentioned, we just started getting out there and, and visiting customers and getting our materials in their labs. And what's next is working with those customers to chart that path towards mass production. And you know, we've just done some fantastic work on what a production line for our material would actually look like. How much would it cost? How big would it be? And I'm very excited that we can now go and raise some money to build that and to start following that path to big revenues and value. Good luck with that. And Emma, you? Yes, so for us at 52 North, we are about to start our Series A funding round. And so we're sort of doing all the work for that and are looking for investors, people that want to partner with us. You know, we're we're getting that product out there. We're wanting to submit for regulatory approval towards the end of the year. So we've got a really viable product that we're really excited about and can't wait to get into the hands of patients. And then on the other side, from my engineering and sort of advocacy and trying to promote engineering, I'm starting a foundation. And the idea of that is to be able to get young people to get their hands dirty with engineering you know um the earlier we can expose them to engineering things you know doing some cad building some things 3d printing all the fun things that we like to do and actually help support our engineering um sort of with the innovation concepting ideation if we can introduce that to them early on we're likely to be able to get more people to start to pursue it as they go through their education. So that's next for me on that platform. But yeah, there's lots of different little things. And I'm I'm hoping that we can all continue to do great things so that the next generation are excited about technology, engineering, STEM, all of those things that make the Cambridge ecosystem, you know, so great and so powerful and has so much to give to the world. And that's exactly why 21 to Watch is so exciting. They're all doing great things across different sectors and they're all addressing big challenges. So I just love it. Yeah, and I think I've said a couple of times, this is what I love about the podcast, getting to meet these early stage companies, sharing these really exciting stories. So, But what's the process? You know, how does it all start again for next year? Well, it's, it, it runs year round. So people literally can nominate whenever they like. But the official start time is always September the 1st. And people nominate until the end of the year. And then we go through a series of judging processes where we announce the shortlist and then the top 21 is always announced on the first Thursday of March each year so it's a date for the diary. Nice and people can watch the whole thing can they on the website as well? Yeah so shortly there will be a video up of the entire event and then we also throughout the year we post the 60 second um, presentations by all the startups to keep giving them some additional exposure. Great. Let's talk about GrowthWorks. It's the fully funded program that's supporting the leaders of ambitious growth businesses to scale and double their profits and productivity. If you're looking to take your business to the next step, GrowthWorks will support you to plan bigger, scale faster, and stay ahead of the game so you can deliver on both your financial and market share targets. Exclusively for businesses across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, GrowthWorks is here to help you. Get started and arrange a call with them on www.growthworks.uk. Well, we've been running news for the last few weeks, and this is the first week we're actually going to be able to do it together, which is exciting. So uh, what's been happening this week? Well, I think the the big thing was a lot of people were heading out to Mobile World Congress, and we just had a quick chat about it, and I think we're both still traumatised from years of, of going and setting up events there yeah i went for i think about 16 or 17 years straight with my o2 and telefonica hat on you went there with ibm did you say yeah so when we it's the wireless e-business um team we we were there you know huge presence each year um and it was just even just the run-up to it and the setup of it was just you know ah so so um matt gooding was posting on linkedin this week 
and he was saying, oh, who's out there? Who can I meet up with? And I'm like, yeah, rather you than me. But by the way, here are a load of people that are going. Yeah. So you're not you're not missing. You're not jealous that you're not there. No. <laughs> no, me neither. No. My feet are thankful as well. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But yeah, there was I mean there was some good contingents out there. So Tim Robinson from Tech East took quite a few people out there. We had um Cambridge Wireless were out there promoting UK tin. So and I think there were quite a few announcements as well. Yeah, so um we've had uh, Eben on the uh, the podcast before. Some some interesting announcements involving Raspberry Pi from World Congress. So they've uh, announced uh in partnership with Vodafone a prototype 5G network built on a ra- uh, kind of wa- Raspberry Pi credit card sized computer. Well, that sounds interesting because it gives you effectively a 5G network in your small business or your house which Sounds like it will solve a lot of coverage issues where you've got black spots or poor in building coverage. So that's that's interesting. And they also unveiled Raspberry Pi Debug Probe, which is a debug hardware solution for ARM-based microcontrollers. And again, where Raspberry Pi I think really stand out is the price points for their products. This thing's just going to be just twelve dollars. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so I'm sure there were loads of other things and there's a Mobile World Congress hashtag for those that do want to go and get their fix. Probably not us though. Um, <laughs> so in other news, Cambridge Flextronics innovator Flex Enable is ramping up from prototyping in, from the Science Park um, headquarters here to volume production. And there's more detail on this on the Business Weekly news pages. And uh, software and industry veteran Casper Hertzberg has been named CEO of Cambridge company Avia following its takeover by French business Schneider Electric. He replaces Peter Herweck, who has become the CEO. We have Speechmatics, who are a speech-to-text API scale-up here in Cambridge. They've joined forces with a French video game producer, Ubisoft, to improve accessibility for the free-to-play video game Brawl Halla. Do you know of that one? Actually, I don't, no. I'll have to check that out. Ubisoft are absolutely huge. So yeah. that's a really exciting uh, deal. Yeah. And we have Cambridge University spin-out, Poly AI. They're expanding across both US and Europe and opening a new R&D facility in New York. That follows on from them raising $40 million in their Series B. And Amadeus Capital Partners, they've got a Cambridge office, haven't they? Um, they're an investor in them too. Earlier this week, I also spoke to Tabitha Goldstop about Innovate Cambridge and the new survey that they're encouraging everyone to complete. Hi, Tabitha. Thanks for joining us today. Hello. So do you want to start with a quick introduction to what Innovate Cambridge actually is? I would. Thank you. Innovate Cambridge, it's an initiative led by Cambridge Enterprise, Cambridge Innovation Capital and the University of Cambridge to create an inclusive, ambitious and broad ranging innovation vision for the Gator Cambridgeshire region. Wow, that sounds very big and and impressive. So how did you get involved in this personally? Because you're not from Cambridge historically, are you? It's a very good question. I'm an entrepreneur by background. Um, I'm also a government advisor. I'm the chair of the AI Council. And my passion really is hosting great conversations, providing a platform for brilliant minds to make a difference. And I moved here in August with my partner because he is a West Suffolk farmer. And I was adamant that I would have to live a stone's throw from the station because I was convinced I'd be commuting to London every day. But after three months of being here, I was very grateful for those of you who made me realise that actually Cambridge was the place to be and that I wanted to be involved in um, in this initiative. And I'm really honoured to lead Innovate Cambridge as its exec director and serve this fascinating ecosystem. I'm grateful for the opportunity because I get to be part of this next phase. That, that's great. Well, w- welcome to Cambridge, first of all. Um, and, and like you said, I think it's it's really good to actually have a variety of people involved in, in building this kind of vision. You know, I think it'll give different perspectives and different thoughts. So, so I, I think I think that you're a very welcome addition, I'm sure. Um, so we, we have a request today, don't we, um, with regards to the survey. Do you want to just explain that? We do. Before I joined, the amazing work done by the team to collect over 500 organizations that have already signed the charter, which is a a show of a shared determination to sort of rally around creating a combined vision. 
but we want to reach more people. And uh, as much as I would really love to talk to everybody and hear directly from the tech community's views one-on-one, um, I've obviously only one person and there's only so much time in the day. So we've designed two short surveys. The first of these surveys is now live and provides an opportunity to highlight the issues that really matter most to you and your listeners. And it should take about five minutes. The deadline is the 20th of March. And ultimately, we will use those responses to help us form our view on the vision part of the exercise. And then we'll come back to people in two months time with a second short survey to gather feedback on the options for the potential innovation visions so that then we can make sure that we are on track to deliver something that the whole of the greater Cambridge region really believes in. Yeah, and that can really get behind. And I I can vouch for it. It does only take a couple of minutes. And do you know what I found when I completed it? It was really nice to actually be asked those questions and to think about what my priorities as a business owner would be. And, you know, just to to kind of put some comments in there. So, you you know, I I really felt like it was a good opportunity to have a say in in what this vision could be. Well, I'm so grateful. I'm already, I'm now intrigued. I'm going to go and have a look at uh, what your response was. I'm I'm glued to the uh, dashboard already. So thank you. Oh, no, no problem at all. So we can share it from the um, Came and Check podcast channels. And, and I think part of the call is asking everyone to expand that reach because there's a lot of people that aren't on the same circles of, of communication. So, so we will definitely share it and, and help people to understand why they need to complete it. But for everyone else, where do they find the survey and what's the deadline? So there's a, a link on the Innovate Cambridge uh, website and uh, obviously on your your social um, is a good place to look for the link. And I think the key thing is if every listener can think of the person that might not normally fill out one of these surveys and get them to give us their opinions, that would also really help. As you say, we need the broadest views in order for this to be successful. And the deadline is the 20th of March. So enough time for a, hopefully a five minute share of your views. You, you do know everyone will leave it to the last minute. Of course. <laughs> And yet I will still be refreshing the the dashboard. (laughs) I was just going to say you will be glued that day for sure. Okay, uh, Tabitha, that's perfect. Thank you very much for just explaining a little bit about Innovate Cambridge, encouraging people to get involved in the survey. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about Innovate Cambridge over the next weeks and months and years. Uh, That's really exciting. And that's the end of the news section this week, which is, as always, provided by our partners, Business Weekly. And that is the end of another bumper episode. Thank you for hosting me, James. It's been lovely. Really, really <laughs> Did you appreciate love being that. Interviewed? Yeah, I love it. It's great. You should great. come on again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, talking about that, do tune in next week when the episode will feature Ilias Khan from Continuum, who has a really valid point on founders remaining within startups at scale. So tune in to hear that. Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show.